and also I'm, I'm forced to do the presentation in English. Well, I would like to do it in French. Uh, anyway, I'll try to communicate what, what I, I feel is essential. <clears throat> Just one question as an introduction. If, as theologian, and educators, we are to meet <clears throat> or respond to African realities through what we can call African theology, what should be the norm, the authority, the content, the method, and the theme of this theology. In brief, what would be the criteria of such theology? This is the, the main concern of our presentation. And we are going to present in three main parts. The first, I would like to, to share with you or what I call an increasing awareness <clears throat> over time, the search of relevance in Africa or within African Christianity. The second, the second uh, point will be a presentation of attempts of responding to African cultural realities. And my last point will be, how do we view our task in responding to African socio-cultural reality? The first part is uh, a short history uh, of this awareness to respond to African realities or, and to respond from African realities through theology. The awareness of, uh, of this we can uh, see it uh, through history. I would like to share with you a quote from Paul Boss, who said this. When one traces back through the interactive links in the earliest phase of the African theology movement, it becomes apparent that the conversation emerged as an articulate entity largely from these two precipitative events in 1960. The one from within Catholic Francophone Africa and derivative of the principal mid-century events of Africa's intellectual life, and the order from within Protestant Anglophone Africa and functioning at the cutting edge of the century-old quest for an effective indigenization of African Christianity. Boas then identify a kind of awareness that is more than one century old. And this before the public emergence of the debate in 60s, in 50s. The first awareness 
that he noticed is from Henry Vane, who set as main goal for the 19th century what he called the indigenization of the Christian faith on mission lands. What was a concern for Vane has been also the value that has led the Pan-African movement at the beginning of the 20th century. This movement set as aim the liberation from colonization and political and intellectual, on political and intellectual level. As favored, as favored by socio-political contest at the mid-century, talking about uh, the 20th century, reflection within African church has raised questions and produced ideas that underline the necessity of African Christianity to have more African color. There have been two major meetings within Catholic Church. The first in 1956 and the second in 1959. Public voices in favor of the Africanization of Christian faith are published as proceedings from the 1956 meeting in a book, De Prêtre Noir Saint Rouge, uh, translated, it will be uh, Black Priest are uh, Wondering. This was in 1957. January 9th, in 1960, at a meeting of students at the uh, Faculté de Théologie de Kinshasa, there was a public debate between a Catholic African priest named Tarsis Chibangu and the missionary teacher Alfred Vanest dean of the faculty who was invited to this meeting. On the Protestant side, it is noted an attachment to the vision of having an indigenous African church based on a more positive appreciation of African culture. In 1926, at the conference held in Belgium, they stress on the necessity of training more African clergymen. However, to this agenda of training indigenous clergy, something else was added following the publication in 1960 of the work of Ben Sinclair under the title, The Christian Ministry in Africa. For this work, had a whole chapter on Christian theology in Africa. So, a responsive theology that takes in account the cultural realities of Africa has been increasingly viewed as a necessity to shape a solid Christianity in Africa on both and Protestant sides. From the debate and the attempts have flourished since then various orientations and approaches that have been proposed and concern have been raised. In 60s and 70s, many articles and books have been published as the result of an increasing concern for the relevance of the missionary Western theology for the church in Africa. In this vein, we can list, I will just list some publication here. Harry Sauer, 
from Sierra Leone who published an article addressing issues raised by Ben Sinclair. Vincent Mulago, who published a book on Un visage africain du christianisme. An African face of Christianism. Idou Bolaji from Nigeria published in 1965 a book uh, Toa and Indigenous Church. John Beatty. He published many, many books. Uh, let me just give you the title of. Uh, Two African Religions and Theology and Philosophy and New Testament Eschatology in African Background. A collective book, a collective book has been published in 1969 as proceedings of a conference organized by the All Africa Council of Churches, AC funded in 19. 63. This conference took place in Ibada. The book is titled Biblical Revelation and African Belief, edited by Kwesi Dixon and Paul Ellingworth. Marik Nol. Ellingworth. That book is translated in French under the title Pour une théologie africaine. Translated literally, it will be for an African theology. All articles were theological essays taking into account the African cultural context, such as John Beatty's article on eschatology. Biancato, on the evangelical side, published a book, Theological Pitfalls in Africa, with a goal to warn again against what he found as drift in the assumptions of many people from Protestant side, especially related to AACC. Cato's sceptical critics of Mbiti pushed us personally to work on Christian eschatology in Africa, according to John Mbiti, for our master's thesis. Bediaku, with the publication of his doctoral dissertation under the title Theology and Identity, is also one of the prominent voices that witnessed for the maturity of the African self-theologizing movement. Many other evangelical voices can be referred to while thinking about African theology as the way of theologizing in a, relevant, in a relevant way in Africa. We can list uh, here Isaac Zokwe, the former president of the first higher theological education in Francophone Africa. Titienu, we can also talk about Barnabé Asokoto and so on. Literature reveals that the conception and the approach to African theology followed two main steps. After the rejection of the missionary approach of Tabula Raza. The first step after the Tabula Raza approach was the step of adaptation. Adaptation was called Africanization in Catholic by Catholic and indigenization by Protestant. Meanwhile, it has been observed that adaptation approach does not allow really to do theology from the whole culture of Africa. Then Reflection moved to another approach. This approach was called enculturation by Catholic 
and contextualization by Protestants. They are not exactly the same. But we can see that many people from Protestant side, while talking about contextualization, the content is what Catholic call enculturation. So at a level, the terminology doesn't make a real difference. However, some think that we should hold to a particular terminology to describe what we try to do. This is a brief history of uh, African theology. Now, I would like to propose or uh, to give two examples of attempts to do relevant theology in Africa. But I think I will not be able to present the two. I will just share one with you. The two examples are one from John Beatty, who proposed a Christian eschatology for Africa. And the second is from Roger Humbeji, who proposed a relevant eschatology for an African, relevant ecclesiology for an African context. Let me talk about John Beatty. The prolific work of Beatty on African religions and African theology earned him the qualification of the father of Africa, African theology. He's done an extensive work on eschatology and has tried to make this doctrine relevant to Africans. His PhD dissertation was one was on the subject New Testament eschatology in an African background, a study of the encounter between New Testament theology and the African traditional concepts. He also wrote a chapter in the collective book, Revelation and uh, African Belief. And uh, his cha this chapter is titled Eschatology. He based his assumptions for a relevant eschatology for Africa on three things. First, African conception of time. Second, eschatological ideas found in African worldview. And third, his findings from the study of the New Testament eschatology. Here are some statements that summarize his proposal. First, for John Beatty, Africans don't have the future dimension of time, and history goes backward for them. Their view, their, their view of time is, is, is like a circle, not a linear view. This conception makes it very difficult for them, according to Mbiti, to plan for progress and to understand discourse that stresses on the future. Because of that, the futurist, the futurist and linear time-driven eschatology taught to them by the Western missionaries was not understood. 
I think he was, uh, uh, his field of study for that was mainly uh, here in Kenya, the Akamba group. The second coming of Jesus in a remote future is not relevant to them. For this reason, they started to hold or to have founders of African initiative churches as the Messiah that have solutions for their problem. This is one of the major reasons why such African churches are proliferating rapidly in Africa. For Miti, there is a need for a more relevant eschatological discourse to Africans. Africans believe in the life after death and in the closeness of the spiritual world. After death, the, the hereafter is uh, composed of dead living that have a personal immortality for people and what he called Aimu. Aimu is uh, uh, ancestors who became, meanwhile, pure spirits. This uh, Aimu, this ancestor who became pure spirit, they, they lose their personal immortality with the death of the last person who knows them by name. The population of the village after death are considered as members and protectors of the community because according to the ontological hierarchy that characterizes African culture, they are superior to human beings. There is no difference between the life after, after death and the life on earth. And there is no judgment to separate between good and bad people. So there is no hope and no teleology in African eschatology. There is no resurrection, and the African idea of reincarnation is not a rebirth of a person, but only the fact that a child can bear characteristic of an ancestor. Uh, these first two points present the context, the cultural context of <coughs> Africa, precisely uh, the Akamba. Third, this is now uh, his assumption about uh, New Testament eschatology. There is not only the conception of a linear time in the Bible, but we can also see the conception of time as the circle. New Testament eschatology is not driven by linear time frame. And it has two dimensions. The first is the horizontal dimension based on time and the second, the vertical dimension that is totally independent of time. The horizontal dimension is influenced by the Jewish apocalyptic context. It is presented in two poles, the already and the not yet. However, the two poles are all Christological, so that we can say that 
New Testament eschatology is a Christological phenomena. The believer has everything in Christ here and now for the present and the future are recapitulated in him. So are heaven and earth, the present world and the new world to come. The emphasis is on the present, the already, and the poorly recognized not yet is nearly suppressed. This is, this is supported, according to Mitty, by the vertical eschatology based on his symbolical interpretation of eight realities from the New Testament. The Gehenna, the fire, the treasure in heaven, the eschatological city, the country of rest, the eating and drinking, the crying and punishment, and the heaven. These are, according to him, images used to only describe the communion of God or the separation from God. Jesus' promise to earth is not a celestial utopia, but his own person being with us here and now. There is no second coming of Christ and nobody, no body, bodily resurrection. There will be a cooperative resurrection at the parousia, which Mithi defines as the recapitulation of everything in God at the end. In conclusion, for, eschat for John B.T., the eschatology that is relevant for Africans is the one that stress on the present appropriation of all that we have in Christ. Failure to do that will keep Africans create their own paradise, paradise and Messiah on earth. We need to stress on the present, not on the future, because the stress on the future leads Africans to, to have all their eyes on heaven so that they forget about the earth. This is a proposal of, uh, uh, of theology to respond to African social reality. Uh, I don't want to, to make uh, my own comments here or to review this because, of course, I did it. But uh, as I'm in front of uh, a great theologian, I want to leave to you the, the task of review it. Or we can do it in uh, the conversation at the end. Now, what is our task in responding to African cultural realities? This I would like to use, for this I would like to use the passage of Ezekiel 37, verse 1 to 14, from which I want to draw a paradigm for our theological task. This is the vision of the dry bones. 
the vision of the dry bones. Uh, I assume that all of us, we know this passage. We know what is, what is in there. First, observation on this passage. First of all, we see that God has sent his prophet He, he has sent his prophet to, to speak to his people. And in sending him, he stressed on certain points. First, he said to Ezekiel, I send you to the children of Israel. Second, you, son of man, listen to what I'm telling you. Do not be rebellious as this family of rebels. Receive in your heart and listen with your ears all, all the words that I will tell you. Third, the Lord asked Ezekiel, Open your mouth and eat what I will give you. This book. And, uh, and then before that, after that, God uh, brought him. He, he, he went to the into the, the to a place, and there he encountered he encountered the glory of the Lord. These are things that God stressed on when. He sent his prophet. And uh, in sending him, he said, My desire is not that the wicked die. I, I want him to change so that he can live. And my call to them is to turn back to me from their wicked ways. And then God promised restoration to his people. His people that was in exile, suffering from different situations. And then came the vision of the dry bones. <clears throat> Observing this vision, we see that it is a strong image to express the promise of God for restoration of his people. And this will be only through his own power. 
but also the restoration to life is placed at the end of the act of the prophet's act of prophesizing. We see two parts in the passage. The first part describes the image, the image of the vision, and the second gives the explanation. Uh, we can do whatever, uh, whatever we we can to understand the the word, the sentences, and this passage. But what I would like to say from that, from the passage, is this: there is an alarming observation. Life is absent. as consequence of the departure of the glory of God. Which means that life will be restored only through the coming back of the glory of God. The prophet's challenge is this. The prophet's challenge, uh, I'm saying the, the challenge to the prophet, what is the challenge to the prophet is this, is to believe what God has said. It is to believe also what God says he can do. is to not be rebellious. Then believe in the word of God, in the power of God, and obey to God. <coughs> the mandate of the prophet is to speak, to speak based on what he received from God. And then from there I draw what I call the imperative of the prophetic theology. Prophetic theology. This is uh, the idea that I I'm trying to grasp from this passage. Uh, first, the first imperative is to see. To see. Second, is to note or notice. I don't know which one of the two words fits here. Sometimes I have confusion about them. First, to see. Second, to note. Third, listen. To listen. Third, uh, fourth, believe. Believe and practice. And five, speak. Ah. Uh, to explain this a bit, I will say this. To see is to be aware of the contest. To be aware of our environment. What, what is happening there? What are the people used to.
what are the the things that we can say? It's uh, are are from God. Even if these people are not Christian, because uh, in every culture we can see God's marks. Then we need to to observe seriously. And now we need to listen. What do we listen to? The word of God. We need to list to listen carefully to what the word of God says. Which means that we don't have a personal solutions from our own in face of the situation that we see and that we know. The word of God. And when we study the word of God, we need to believe. We, we don't do just an intellectual, study, an, an intellectual study of the word of God. We need to engage our whole life with the word of God and leave the word of God out. And then we can be qualified to speak relevantly to our people and this will bring restoration. To summarize our theological task is to know our realities and the realities of our people. It is also to be dedicated to God as God says to the as the prophet says the hand the hand of the Lord was on me. We need to do a sound and deep study of the scripture. Sometimes people will say, uh, what are you doing there? Studying Hebrew, studying Greek, it's a, it's a waste of time. Because you will not use Greek and Hebrew in the church to, to, to respond to situation. And I see this as a, as a, a drift. If we don't want to, to learn the original languages and to be able to study the word of God deeply and expose it faithfully, I think uh, we rather uh, go to secular university to study sociology, anthropology, psychology, and all that is studied there to help people. Uh, we can help people with anthropology, with sociology, all this. But the main task of the theologian is to respond to situation from the word of God. And we need to study it deeply. Uh, I usually say that we, we have not yet sufficiently study the word of God in Africa. If we want to respond to our socio-cultural realities, 
it will be in studying deeply this, the word of God and exposing it. And uh, we need to carry what we are exposing uh, to put it in another way. The word of God needs to become to become uh, like a food that nourishes our life. So we can carry it, we can be energized by it, and uh, we can be shaped by it. And finally, speak according, according to the language and other cultural realities of your people. Language issue here is very crucial. I, I, I tell students that if you want to be relevant, you want to have impact in your people, you need to start preaching, teaching in your own language. This will lead you to, to not just throw on people what you have memorized in the theological school. You will talk to them in a relevant way. Language is not only uh, word uh, and, and sentences. Language is also all all the, the cate categories that we use to communicate. We have idioms, we have uh, our own way to, to speak, to communicate. So we need to be aware of all this. We have symbols. We have symbols. We have, we have many things in our own culture that can allow us to speak to our people relevantly. Otherwise, uh, we will talk to them, but they, will, they won't hear anything. As a result, we will have a transformed church arrayed in battle for the kingdom's work and transforming our society. I have here eight areas where I think we, we need to, to work and uh, uh, in responding to, to the social cultural realities. As theological educators, what should be our role? And what can, what, what kind of theology to teach and to have our students teach to their communities? This is where I propose that the assessment grid for such theology must be the following. Does this theology make Africans encounter Christ, the Lord and Savior, according to the gospel from the holy and inspired word of God so that in welcoming him, they experiment in him restoration in their socio-cultural situation and become agent of restoration in their own socio-cultural context. Thank you. So, uh, 
I'm not sure about the MBT example of why that was raised. I, I'm sure that was as a bad example. But, um, <laughs> but what I want to... Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I have chosen it uh, intentionally. It, it is my strategy to challenge us. Because when we, we say, oh, we don't want to deal with these things, there are people doing it. And they are doing it with their own norm. They are doing it with their own method. They are doing it with their own faith. And what is happening? So uh, for my own example, I was in theological study. When I read about this and I said, oh, this, I need to study it. This is what led me to study John Beatty in his theology, especially uh, the present and the future in his eschatology. And uh, this is uh, my way of challenging us, saying that we need to work. If we don't want to do, people will do it, and they will do it in their, uh, according to their foundation. That's great. I knew you were going to say that. That's why I wanted him to say that.